Assalamu alaikum and a very warm welcome to Natural Health on the Dean Channel with me, Dr. Fatima Parak. Join us here each week on Natural Health where we hope to bring you up to date and informed information on what's happening in the world of natural health. Today we are very lucky to have with us Dula Zuleika Ismail who's here to share with us what she does and her experiences for new mums in the labor and childbirth process. Thank you Zuleika for joining us here today. Thank you for having me, Fatima. Tell me, Zuleika, what is it that a doula does? A doula is a trained birth companion. Uh, she is um, a non-medical professional, but she's trained in using non-medicated pain relief methods to help a mum and her partner during the labor and birth process. So basically, she's a support person. She's there to help them through the trying times of labor and birth especially because it can become quite emotional and it can be quite, uh, become quite overwhelming to the couple going through this process. Um, whether it's the first or the second time, we have to help them to get through the process if the, the first time was, wasn't a difficult, was a difficult birth pro process and the second time we have to help them to forget what they've been through previously and help them to get through it in the best manner possible. So when does one start then interacting with the doula if you're pregnant? It, does it start very early on in the pregnancy? Is it the latter part of the pregnancy? And how far does it extend after the birth process? Okay, a person can start uh, at the beginning of the pregnancy. The doula will not start to see them before 12 weeks uh, pregnancy has been confirmed. Because in the first three months we know that the pregnancy um, is in a very unstable situation. Once it's been confirmed 12 weeks and we're continuing with the pregnancy, uh, the client can come to see her doula and uh, indicate what she requires from the doula, whether she wants her, her services during the antenatal phase, whether she wants her services during the birth and the labor process, and w or whether she wants her services during the postnatal phase. So it's co it's continuing support from the doula from the beginning right through the uh, the, the antenatal process. Uh, I do antenatal classes. So I advise my clients to come to classes with me, whether they intend to use me during uh, the labor and birth process or not. And some just prefer postnatal services, which is fine. So tell me, you started off in the nursing field. How did you make your way into becoming a doula? I know prior to becoming a doula, you also studied a few other courses in the allied health professionals uh, under that umbrella. And you're now integrating that into your profession as a doula. Tell me a little about your history. Okay, I started off uh, training as a nurse, which I, I, I didn't like at all. I didn't know that I was going to be the, using the nursing experience as I progressed through my life. I subsequently got married, had two children, and then decided what I really wanted to do with my life. Um, I became an allied health professional. I trained as an aromatherapist and reflexologist, therapeutic massage therapist. And then I decided that if I can help moms during the pregnancy pro process where their bodies are ringing in the changes of pregnancy, helping them with the massage and helping them with their, their sore backs and whatever, I could maybe take it a little bit forward because people were constantly asking me if I could help them through the labor and birth and the postnatal process. Uh, I then went on to find out who the doula trainers are and I subsequently ended up doing three doula trainings before I found what really suited me and that's how my history just progressed. Zuleika, it's so interesting that you seem to have found a niche in, in the market and the sudden need for having doulas around, having assisted births, having someone to turn to, someone that's educated in this profession. Tell me a little more about how people have changed over time and what their take now is on having a doula present. I feel that they need it because people's expectations nowadays are quite high and uh, they tend to stress easily. And I don't know if it's too much of information overload because they are, uh, information is available to them over social media. But what they need to understand is that nothing has changed over the years. If a woman's body was designed to birth a baby, a woman's body is still designed to birth a baby naturally. They just need to relax into the process and that's what my job is to help them and explain to them and understand how they can use techniques, uh, especially during the antenatal phase. And even if they don't use me as a labor and birth doula, they are armed with information to use in the labor ward during the labor process. 
So it's very important to make sure that they know what to expect and we enact a whole labor room scene so that they are aware of what to find when they go into the hospital. Talking about hospitals and labor rooms, are hospital, hospitals now open to having doulas present? Um, tell me a little about that. Contrary to popular belief, people felt that uh, for doulas to go into hospital was a no-no. And uh, I must debunk that myth because I find that hospitals are so, uh, well the nurses particularly, are so happy to have you because the labor ward can become a pretty busy place. On some days there are people there in labor, some of them come just to be uh, monitored to see what their baby's heart rate is like. Some people are so nervous that they go to the labor ward to check whether in labor a good three, four or five times, which is not a problem because a woman is, is nervous and she needs to know. But uh, when a doula goes in to help her client, the nurses know that the doula is going to inform them of changes to that client, but she's not going to take over the nursing of that client. She's just going to be on their page all the time. So it's an extra support system for the nurses themselves in the hospitals and they, I'm sure they're quite welcome to it as such. Well, fortunately I've seen that more often recently and they're quite happy to have us in there. Uh, I haven't uh, had any problems, no. And how does medical aid support this? Um, previously it was just Fed Health and Momentum that came on supporting doulas and now discovery has come on recently and doulas were, are in the process of getting their practice numbers re really soon. We're talking about the new year. So there is change, there is change being affected and people are taking on to this, even medical aids all of a sudden. Especially because they've seen the decrease in the caesarean rate, the, the, the decrease in the rate of epidurals, there's been a decrease of, uh, uh, in the use of epidurals from 60%. People used to use uh, epidurals very often and when they're supported during labour, there's a decrease of 60% of use of epidurals, there's a decrease of 50% of use uh, of, of people going into C-sections, uh, there's a 40% decrease of the use of vacuums and forceps and 25% uh, uh, of the people find that uh, they can actually have a shorter labor because they have somebody guiding them through the process. And how do you prepare a woman for this process, the whole birthing process and labor? I mean, what's important for them to know? You've got to listen to them. You've got to ask them what their fears are. And no two clients can possibly be the same. Because uh, you get somebody who's going to, the, to it for the very first time. And naturally, our girls are having their babies much younger. So because it's something that they, they're not familiar with, they want to, to be explained to them uh, right down to the last detail. And and when they know exactly what to expect, I, I think that ignorance is not bliss. When people know what's going to happen, they, they're fully armed in a way and they're easily able to take on that process. Uh, people who are going through it for the second time, you need to help them to lose their fear of the previous birth that they went through. So it's important that you listen to your client and you ask them what their fears are and don't make small of whatever they are asking you to do because each person is unique. Do you find a lot of women struggle with their second pregnancies, um, I'm sorry, their second labors and third labors because of um, uneventful? Um, generally, we, we find that if they haven't had support with the first pregnancy, some of them have gone into a C-section situation and a lot of them are trying for, for VBACs, which is vaginal birth after C-section. And we've had a lot of success in, in those terms because the time span between having a C-section and being allowed to have a normal delivery depends on how the doctor monitors you. If the doctor monitors you and finds that in a shorter time span you can actually go for a, a normal delivery after a c-section uh, the doctor will advise you and say listen um, even if you've had your baby less than two years prior uh, you are quite okay to go for a normal delivery after a c-section and a lot of them are quite surprised to find that their bodies can actually do it so those are the ones that we have to coach quite a bit and it, I must say it's an exhilarating experience for them to go through a normal delivery after a c-section Tell me a little about what happens after the labor process. What kind of support does a mom need immediately after that? 
Okay, because her body has been accelerating during the labor process and she's been asked to call on all her reserves, you must remember labor can be quite long and quite tiring and the doula has to keep the mom well hydrated. Uh, the Better Births Initiative states that you've got to make sure that a mom eats and drinks during her labor so that she has energy at the end of it. And because we know that during the labor process and the birthing process particularly, she's exhausted, you've got to help her to come from that very high uh, accelerated situation and calm her down and then you've got to put her baby onto her chest the skin to skin, to skin process after that is Im extremely important both for mom and baby because it helps the stress hormone uh, levels to decrease it brings baby close back close to the mom we employ something that we call delayed cord clamping which uh, uh, assists baby with the breathing process because the baby is taking in air for the very first time straight after the birth using their lungs but they're still getting oxygen rich blood from the cord and uh, this in turn helps baby's color to change from blue to a healthy pink. When you say delayed cord clamping how long in terms of time do we have to work with? Well I'm not going to mention names but a doctor that I've worked with has actually set a record of 20 minutes of delayed cord clamping in which we find that because baby is fed with so much of oxygen rich blood and taking in air as well baby's temperature control is e excellent and baby turns a healthy pink and then baby is so alert after the birth and able to latch on and that's the actual doula hour when you help a mom to start breastfeeding her baby after the birth because you know that babies are designed to breastfeed. Is this delayed cord clamping, is it viable for both natural births and cesarean sections? Unfortunately not. It's, it's a natural birth uh, technique that we implement. But if your baby's uh, cord had to be clamped quite early after a C-section, we know for instance that you take the baby and you put it onto mom's chest, the skin to skin contact, and if mom is not too well after the C-section, some moms become hypotensive after a C-section, we ask dad to hold the baby close to his chest. And that helps the baby through that process. What's the role of dad in this whole process? Um, some, some dads tend to shun away from this, others are very enthusiastic. What's your experience? Um, nowadays dads are very much included in this process you must remember that men are so supportive of their wives and we should not uh, turn a blind eye to how much they are prepared to do for their wives um, I personally run a one-on-one -on -one antenatal and I insist on having both mom and dad present and in uh, maintaining the Muslim ethos because I just don't believe that uh, Muslim women are comfortable doing the different birth positions in, in a public uh, um, antenatal environment so I take them through that process and I am amazed at how many questions and informed questions that the husbands ask and they're very very interested in what's going on so they're very much included in the whole labor and birth process. You spoke a little about breastfeeding and latching on in that first hour or two. Why do lots of women have problems with this? For some of them um, just latching the baby on can be a difficult situation because they don't know how to face baby. We, we in, encourage them that baby must be tummy to mummy, whether they're in the rugby ball position or whether they're in the normal uh, breastfeeding position, which is uh, holding, uh, holding the baby on the arm, facing the baby towards the mum. The problems happen when baby actually latches on to mum because it can be quite painful for the first time. And you have to explain to the mum that there's hardly any milk at the beginning. There's just colostrum and that the more the baby sucks the, the bigger the yield so that we know we have to explain to them that colostrum just just five um, five moles of colostrum can keep a baby going for sometimes 12 hours after birth but we ask them to feed as often as baby needs it so demand feeding is necessary you can't um, uh, get a baby into a routine in the first two weeks and uh, when you help them to when you explain it to them you've got to be on their page every single day when you're helping the mom through the best breastfeeding process we've seen such a change in the way people see breastfeeding i think it's grown in popularity people are more educated now about the benefits what's your experience with this the very first time a baby gets breast milk into their system that's the start of their building up of their immunity and uh, we know that breast milk is the gold standard of, of uh, nurturing a baby. Uh, babies are able to um, 
uh, the the tummies are able to handle breast milk better. The the what happens with colostrum is that not only does it nurture a baby, it prevents what we call leaking gut syndrome. It helps the baby's uh, system to adjust. We we see a lesser rate of allergens developing in the baby, and it has what we call a gastrocolic reflex, where it helps uh, all the meconium and the excess waste that passes through baby's gut during the birth process to come out. So you find that baby defecates easily, and that's how that whole natural peristaltic movement takes place. So are you finding a change in trend then? Are more people opting to breastfeed than previously? Yes, definitely. What we find, uh, what I need to tell moms is that babies are designed to breastfeed and all, all moms are not compliant with breastfeeding. We have to make them understand that breastfeeding can be quite natural and a lot of them are afraid of becoming engorged. So as a lactation consultant you have to help them to get through those different phases because mom may be interested and baby may not. And yeah, that's how you get them to do it. What about the mental emotional benefits, both for mom and baby, that bonding process, that very special time that a mom just has with your child? Um, there's a lot to be said for that. I mean, if you think of psychosocial development and the bonding that happens between mom and child, what do you think uh, you know, benefits a new mom in terms of breastfeeding or any other activities that can enhance that bond? Well, you know, the, the thing that, that moms uh, uh, have told me time and time again is that when they spend time with their babies, when they actually breastfeed, it is such a close emotional bond. It helps to decrease stress hormones and it helps the mom and the baby to relax because they've, they've spent so much of time with each other when baby was in utero and then the separation took place during the birth. But then that bond is reinitiated because we know that when a mom feeds her baby, the risk of postpartum depression lessens and uh, there's a two-sided effect. Mom loses a lot of weight when she's breastfeeding. The other important thing I think we need to make mention of is that we're always told, you know, put the baby down. They're going to learn bad habits if you're carrying them all the time. But there's a lot to be said about kangaroo care and skin-to-skin -skin contact between mom and child, especially, I would say, in the formative um, weeks after labor. What's your experience with this? Kangaroo care is so important because it keeps the baby calm. And people say to you that if a baby cries a lot, they're opening their lungs. I don't see why they have to physically open their lungs uh, uh, by crying because we know that just by breathing and when, we, uh, when they're closer to their moms, they're breathing naturally, they're breathing deeply, they sleep better. Um, some moms feel that if they kangaroo their babies too much, they're going to put them into bad habits. You can't do any bad habits during the first six weeks. You can only benefit your baby during that time. So kangaroo care is not just limited to mom. Skin to skin contact with the dad is also equally important. How are dads taking to this? Are they engaging in this practice? Are they offering to bond with their child when mom's having a break? As I said earlier, dads are so invested in spending time with their, with their babies and in helping their wives in whatever way possible. And because they couldn't carry that baby physically, they couldn't birth that baby physically as well, uh, emotionally they are very invested in helping their wives not only to um, change nappies, uh, they, they're very good at burping. I must say, I give them five stars for burping babies and I teach them how to do that. It's lovely to notice the change in society from a few generations back when men had a hands-off approach to this entire process and now where they are making themselves present in every step of the way. Um, you know, when you, s when you explain to people that there, there is a bond during marriage, it's not just a bond when they get married, it's a bond that increases and deepens when they start having a family. And especially so because in today's times, women are also working and they have to take time off sometimes during the pregnancy because they're not well and sometimes uh, they are they work to the end and they're quite exhausted and when their husbands support them that helps to give them energy to do this whole process and that's important especially during the confinement phase where they need somebody to help them to to get through the the day when they've hardly had any sleep at night so dad tends to take over quite a bit you've touched a little bit on postpartum depression in women after birthing 
it's such an important thing and I find that a lot of times it's swept under the mat. What do women need to look out for in terms of signs and symptoms of postpartum depression? It's important to know your client well and to see the symptoms and even if the client hasn't had a doula, for the people around her to know her well. Um, I find that people that are, have OCD when it comes to having things in place find that they become easily depressed especially because they are unable or they don't have the energy or they don't have the resources to keep their houses exactly the way they had it uh, before baby because so much of time is spent with baby and that helps them to go into postpartum depression. Simple things like um, has somebody done the shopping they have to learn to delegate it's important that you you understand that you need help after you've had a baby and it's very important to notice the warning signs the mom tends to break away from her baby she doesn't want to have anything to do with the baby or she breastfeeds very reluctantly don't force her ask her what's the problem ask her to talk in my experience when you don't actually recognize the symptoms and you let it go or on the flip side if the symptoms are being recognized but you're being advised that you know being a mom is difficult and you'll get through it just hang in there you know plod through it is that the right kind of advice we need to be giving people because I find that a lot of times postpartum that hasn't been treated tends to still linger on in that mom it's never really quite put to bed I think she's got too many things to deal with notwithstanding that people come into her environment on a daily basis we have a lot of people coming to visit her and all of a sudden everybody uh, is talking about their birth experience about their breastfeeding experience everybody's suddenly a, a professional when it comes to that they don't realize that she's going through her experience her experience is unique to her she may not have the mental capacity to handle it because she's exhausted uh, don't foist your opinion on a mother because she's got too much to deal with listen to her on a daily basis and that's how you'll help her to deal with the changes that are taking place in her life. So even socially, we need to be aware of a mom's needs when you're visiting, when you're speaking to a mom. Influx of information is always not that good because really, one shoe doesn't fit everyone. Everyone's experience is different, everyone's an individual, every baby is different as well. So we almost, in some ways, you know, creating a disservice for this mom. We're putting in a very awkward situation with lots of different opinions and, and skills and, you know, um, tools that you could use, but none of them might actually benefit her own child. As I said, you've got to treat the mom uniquely and you've got to be non-judgmental. People seem to think that if something worked for one person, it's necessarily going to work for the next person. We don't know what her true fears are. She may just be uh, uh, uncomfortable to feed in front of a room full of ladies. And you've got to give her that space and don't make it seem that she's not being uh, sociable by asking somebody to leave the room when she needs to breastfeed. It's just that she needs a quiet space, the baby needs to bond with their mom and that's how breastfeeding is initiated. Um, also if she's tired she can say to people if you're coming to visit now it's not a good time for me but if you want to see baby I don't mind you seeing baby. Not everybody has to pick up a baby either. A sleeping baby gets picked up, their routine gets disturbed especially if they've just been uh, well fed and put down to sleep and that can also disturb the whole um, calming process that takes place during the day. Remember mom's up alone at night breastfeeding. It's quite exhausting. Everybody's having a good sleep and they tend to have lots of energy to visit the next day. She hasn't had a chance to sleep at all. Those are really interesting points that you know come up and for people to be aware of. Um, another quick question. What's the benefit of having a Muslim doula present during the birthing process? A Muslim doula helps them to keep the Islamic ethos in that labor ward. It's so important to remember that there's a state of haya that needs to be implemented when a woman's giving birth. Uh, you must remember she's giving birth from a very intimate place. She needs to be covered at all times. Whether, she's, whether you have a nurse just walking in, whether you have a cleaner walking into that labor ward. It's important to ensure that mom is covered, that you remind her that she needs to read her salah because labor can be quite long and also that she must read her du'as when she's in labor because that's when all do us get answered. Thank you so much Zuleika for joining us here today on Natural Health. It's been really informative and interesting. We hope to see you again sometime. Inshallah, thank you so much for having me. It was really lovely. Thank you so much for joining us here today on Natural Health. We do hope to see you next week. Until then, Assalamu Alaikum.